Hello, brothers and sisters. Good morning from the land down under here in nice and brisk Australia, Melbourne, Australia. I, 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 I'm, I'm really excited. Um, there's, there's so much coalescing and converging that is going on right now. Um, and I, I, I'm just waiting for the trumpet to sound and I, I'm just at any moment expecting it. Uh, God is sovereign, of course, no question, but my goodness, what an awesome expectation that we have. And I just, oh, everyone, please come on in. Um, so many things are being revealed at this moment. And it's almost like the floodgates of revealed prophecy are really being opened now. I, I, I just have like this, this, uh, uh, th this image in my mind's eye that there's this gigantic wheel, you know, where the hands of God are turning it and opening it up, right? So the flood of pouring out of God's spirit, as he said that he's going to do in the last days and people uh, prophesying and dreaming and, and, and so forth. I, I just, I'm so excited about it. And I'm even more excited and privileged and humbled by being able to show things that I believe that the Lord has shown me to my brothers and sisters. I want you to be so encouraged that Jesus is about to call up his bride. Be happy, be joyful, be expectant, be repentant, be prayed up, be filled with the spirit, be just filled with the love of God. Amen. Because our the word tells us that if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh like the rest of the people on the earth. Amen. All right. So that's, that's what we have today. Here's what I'm going to do. Thank you, Abba. Um, one of the things that I am going to do today is I am going to show you what I believe was yet again. And I am just, I'm just boggled by this. I, I just am so amazed more and more when I keep having things revealed. And, you know, our, our brother, Dr. Berrioff, uh, love him and, and and say what you will. He definitely searches the scriptures. Okay. Now we may not all, uh, you know, come into perfect alignment and agreement with what everything is as far as what uh, the meaning may be of a particular scripture. But the point of that is every one of us are going to be at our personal point of revelation, if you understand what I'm saying. That does not mean just because you may personally not agree with a particular position that's held. So for example, there, at, at this stage, not only is there a lot of revelation, I think, that's taking place, but I think also there's a lot of pushback from those who are just desperately opposed, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to any revelation actually taking place. In other words, it's no, oh, dear Sister Paulette, so good to see you here. Ah, amen. Ah, amen. All right. The uh, 
Oh, Brother Mike, Repo Man 64 has just stated troops are on the streets in California and Pennsylvania. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. And yes, just as he says, we all agree that Jesus is God and our Savior. And for those that disagree, I pray that that revelation is given to you because there is not much time left. If you don't hold that view, then you are, in my estimation, in a very precarious position. You don't want to be there. And we don't want you to be there. We want you to come into this loving relationship that we have tasted and found to be so amazing. All right. With our heavenly bridegroom, Jesus. All right. All right. So that's that's what I want to say. It, here is one of the things. So what? Oh, and I feel Holy Spirit right now. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yes. Give me the words to say. It's it's going to happen so soon. So what am I saying right now? I believe that what I have just been shown is the three harvest slash rapture groups in the most beautiful song of songs, the song of Solomon. And, and, and I keep, as of late, so many of these things just keep coming out as I keep reading, as I keep being prompted by Holy Spirit. Uh, and Brother Mike, I'm so glad to see you here. Uh, everybody say hi to Brother Mike. If you have not subscribed to Repo Man 64's channel, why not? What are you waiting for? There are so many good channels out there. And Brother Mike is doing so well to turn you on to all of these other channels that while we may not agree on every single point, we agree on the most important point. Jesus is God. Jesus is our Savior. And Jesus is coming back for his bride. Amen? That's what we want to say. And so what are we doing? We are looking for our Lord and Savior. That's what we're doing right now. So what has happened with me is yet once again, I believe that three harvest rapture groups that I believe and I have been uh, preaching on for the last couple of, well, actually, the last couple of years that have been on YouTube, but of course it goes way back to 1989 when I met Jesus face to face in heaven. And uh, so from that moment, from that moment, I have not ceased to tell people about God's love for them, which is unimaginably deep. It is infinitely deep, unfathomably deep. You will never know the depth of it here, but you can, you can, and all you have to do is ask. So what's happened is he has poured out his spirit in the last days, and he's given uh, old and young men dreams and visions. Uh, thankfully, I have received both. So that kind of means that I'm not either one or the other, right? I can be a young man. Um, and so, <laughs> so that's that's what I'm saying right here. But I think that what he has shown me now, this beautiful song that talks about, and I believe a lot more now, see that there is a bride, that there is a church that's in there, right? Well, what I see now is I see all three. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to read you a few things uh, out of the Song of Solomon. I'm not going to read a lot, but I want to make my point. OK, now the Song of Solomon is eight chapters long. And uh, and so I'm going to highlight a couple of things because they're in those eight chapters are 
kind of like several sidebars. And that's the way that uh, biblical texts were written. They weren't exactly all necessarily done in a linear fashion. There are linear sections, but sometimes they will go in and they will do a sidebar that kind of summarizes what they're saying previously or what the whole story is. Do you understand? Okay. And this, yes, dear Sister Paulette, the Song of Solomon, Jesus and his bride, that, but we're going to go deeper than that today, right? That's what we're going to do. So let's talk about this. And I'm going to talk about where I see the pre-trib rapture of the Gentile bride of Christ, where I see the left behind church and when you see this, you cannot unsee it, brothers and sisters. You just can't. You go like, oh, wow, I didn't see that before. That's the opening of the book for you. All right. So, so I pray, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you that you are going to impress upon those that are watching this message right now the truth of it. Open up the scriptures as I read them to everyone that is hearing. Let them have ears to hear that they might understand and know, dear heavenly Abba, just how close it is before you send Jesus to call us up into the air. And I pray this in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so let's, let's do that. So that way, this is not going to be so long, and I'm going to make my point, and then we can uh, uh, see it everywhere. Oh, dear sister Sue, all right, it's so good. Yes, three raptures are everywhere. Now, can I make a sidebar here, if I can, for a moment? There is a huge pushback on this. And I think that there's more than just a couple of reasons for that. That if you are not going to be willing to listen to the promptings of Holy Spirit, or let's say that in fear, you're afraid to listen to anything else because you might be deceived, or you are thinking, no, I know what's actually right. You are a loon, Mr. Fowler, and nothing you are saying is accurate. You are of the devil and those types of things. There's a lot more that I could say about this. And, and my concern is actually for you. I, I, I'm saying be willing to listen. And why? Because... We know from Daniel that everything from the end times was sealed. But praise God, he said that at the time of the end, that book will be unsealed and opened. And then we would understand as we go in, we would get this revelation of what Abba is trying to say to us. Amen. All right, so let's get into this. Let's find out where there are three harvest groups. Now, this, this is so very biblical. And when I say three raptures, now there, there are those, that's, that's what I'm going to say is, no, there's only one. Well, okay, I'm pleased that you see that there is at least one right? That is good. But let's not throw away all of these scriptures. I'm asking you, take this before the Lord yourself. Take this into your prayer and meditation time and ask the Lord whether or not this is true for you to open up these scriptures that you might see. God's word is so deep. It's so deep. And I'm not stopping here. I'm going to keep going. And the deeper we go, the more we know about our heavenly bridegroom, about Jesus. Amen.
All right. So these three harvest groups are just like the harvest model, and they are the three rapture groups that, and, and I'm not, I've discussed this on so many messages. I encourage you, our, our sister, uh, uh, Sue Keith, that you can see here, uh, she, she does so well on hers as, as well. So uh, I, I wish that you would go out and check out these, uh, these other brothers and sisters that are coming on. And then let me add one. Um, Crowing Rooster Prophecy.com, our brother over there, he has come in and I saw one of his early, uh, one of the messages that he just put out, uh, I believe like last week. And in that, I saw once again, he was pointing out three rapture groups. And I contacted him and I left a message on his, uh, on his uh, comment section. And I pointed out that. And he responded, of course, as to the insight that I had had there. Well, it's not my insight. It's the revelation of that. The insight was for him. Amen. And I'm so pleased that this, th that this revelation is being just spread out among God's family. Amen. So let's see that. If you haven't uh, subscribed to the people, subscribe to them. And let me say, you don't have to believe in every point. What we want to do is we want to expand God's reach through these messages in all people that understand that Jesus as God came as a man, died on a cross, was buried and rose again after three days, paying the full penalty of our sin debt that we couldn't pay. Amen. That is the gospel in a nutshell. And we all agree, at least I'm hoping that we all agree at that most foundational point. You don't have to agree at every other point. And the reason why I say that is because we all have a little bit of revelation and a little bit more and a little bit more. So we're all just slightly out of sync, as it were, that, uh, that that's the case. Oh, you're so welcome, Sister Sue. That's what it is. That's what it is. We all have to take into account that we have that different levels of revelation. But what's going to happen is that when that rhema word comes alive in you and you have another revealed word that you hadn't seen before, then you go like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Right. So what I'm saying is don't just discount that there are three harvest rapture groups that when you see it, you see it from the beginning of the Bible to the very end. It's in every spot. Now, let me show you what I see about it as far as the song of songs, the most beautiful love song that's in the Bible, so intimate. And that's what we want. That's what Jesus wants. He wants that level of intimacy with each and every one of you individually. And he can do that because he's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's everywhere in all places at all times. You cannot take all of him, but you can receive all of him and give him all of yourself so that you and him can be as if or like you were the only people in all of creation that ever existed, just you and him. And he can do that with every single person in all of creation. Amen. 
Oh man, I hope that you received that word. All right, so there are three harvest groups. There's a pre-tribulation group. There is a mid-tribulation group, and there is a post-tribulation group, okay? Now, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. And while there are many messages, let me ask you to check out the, uh, the other brothers and sisters that I've just mentioned. Search them out for yourself as well, okay? And, and subscribe and check out their messages. Be filled with God's word as they preach it to you. And then I am uh, I, I'm wanting you to be open for this now and to look up. Is there anyone that's not looking around at the world right now and not seeing that we are in the last moments of the last moments of the last hours of the last days? Oh, I hope not. I hope not. All right. All right. It is it's just so amazing. All right. So out of those three rapture groups, they're all true. They're all true. And when we take the totality of Scripture, all of it, don't set any of it aside, right? Because the Word says... It, Jesus himself says that the entire volume of the book speaks of him, right? He is our great and glorious bridegroom. He is our, uh, he is our everything. Amen? All right. So let's, let's look at that. He, let's look at that. He says that. Don't set any part of the word aside. Because in Timothy, it tells us that all of it is, is useful and beneficial to us for our training, edification, building up, for getting us prepared and ready. Amen. All right. So in this particular message, let's talk about the three harvest groups, the pre-trib rapture of the bride, the mid-trib rapture of the left behind church. And don't, don't shrink back from that, okay? Excuse me. Don't shrink back from that thinking like, oh no, oh no, there's only one. There's only one rapture and only one resurrection event. And some people like to do that. They want to tie them together and discount some other words of God just like the Apostle Paul that tells us that there are that there's an order involved. Well, you can't have an order unless there's more than one, right? Okay, that's what we're trying to say here. You can't just like scratch your head. Well, I don't understand that, but it can't be true. Just follow me here, okay? Just follow me. All right. So the pre-trib rapture of the Gentile bride. So let's go ahead and get into the Song of Solomon. And for this, now in this particular instance, I am reading all three sections from the Amplified Bible because I want to include some deeper meanings that we have from the Greek, okay? And I think that's very important. It's, it's, so easy sometimes and to be able to have a more superficial or surface level understanding. But when we actually have the deeper meanings of some of the words involved, then we go like, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I can see where that makes sense. Do you understand? So that's the reason for that. I'm not discounting anything else. But just bear with me for a second, and I'm going to read that. So our first section, where I say that the pre-tribulation rapture of the Gentile bride takes place, we're going to read from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and I'm going to read you verses 8 through 14, okay? All right. Now, as we're reading from the Amplified Bible, what they do is they take and they make 
some sections, right? Now, there are other translations that do the same thing, that identify that there is more than one person or group that is speaking here. And so they highlight what they believe that that is. So in this instance, they start and they list the Shulamite bride. Amen. Now, the Shulamite is a Gentile. And so that's what, so I want you to highlight, and I'm going to talk about these. And then starting in, uh, in verse 14, then we have the bridegroom. And who is our bridegroom? That's Jesus, right? That's what we want to see out of this. When we see this, we understand it. All right. So let's going to read starting at verse eight. And this is in their estimation, the Shulamite bride, and I'm going to agree. Listen, my beloved, behold, he comes climbing on the mountains, leaping and running on the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he is standing behind our wall. He's looking through the windows. He's gazing through the lattice. My beloved speaks, and he says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth once again. The time for singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree has budded and ripens her figs, and the vines are in blossom and give forth their fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away to climb the rocky steps of the hillside. Then the bridegroom in verse 14 Oh, my dove, here in the clefts in the rock, in the sheltered and secret place of the steep pathway, let me see your face. Amen. Now, in this, out of this, we have, th this word is so pregnant with connections and, 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 and just, uh, other points of scripture that we see in this, right? So she's listening for the voice of her bridegroom. You hear her? She's, listen, wait, do you hear that? There's the voice, right? Climbing on the mountain. So you're looking up. You see the top of the mountains and over that top. So as we're looking up, we see up where the mountain tops come into the clouds. There's Jesus, right? And he's saying to me, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to see that that is a symbolic picture of the pre-trib rapture of the Gentile bride of Christ right there. And then he tells us what time season that's uh, when this occurs. And that time season, I believe, is right now. I believe that's right now. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth once again, the time for singing has come. Amen. Amen. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. And there have been other people that have discussed this uh, uh, as well. And uh, it, it's, it's just amazing. I see like uh, our sister Tiffany is listing some other things. And look, I am not going to read the entire song of songs. I encourage you to do so. There is so much beautiful, intimate language that's there and an and, and intimacy that is shared 
by a bride and the bridegroom, okay? And that is what we see. This is about the union of Jesus with his bride. And that's what this is all about. Now, now let me take another aside because there's this, there's this idea and, and I can see how some people might get, I, I guess, in a sense, sidetracked by this. And that's this idea where they use this term now that the bride of Christ is one woman. Now, what are they really saying when they say that? They're saying, first off, it's one entity thing, one individual thing. Uh, some people say that, you know, it's a, a building or some other type of inanimate object. Uh, other people say that of the same type of group that it is uh, one human woman. And uh, what I would say is that is very short-sighted and fleshly thinking. And I don't mean that in a mean way. If you hold this position, what I'm saying is I don't believe that you have a true understanding of what marriage means as it relates to the spiritual union of the bride of Christ and Jesus, okay? That, that's what I would say. That's what I would say. And why? Why do I say that? It's because, well, then there's these other places where uh, Jesus says that you err not understanding the scriptures because there will not be any in heaven. There's no giving in marriage, right? And and so you go like, w -w -w wait a minute. Okay, I'm confused. Jesus, if all of this is about, you know, the father finding a bride for his son, and we talk about this again, then why are you saying that in heaven that there's not going to be any marrying or giving into marriage? That seems to be contradictory, right? But no, not at all. Now, I, I can speak only to this from my personal experience. You are not required or necessarily inclined to believe me at all. That's what I'm saying. Anything that I say, I ask you to take before the Lord, okay? However, what I'm saying is that I experienced when I had my afterlife experience in both times, because there were two of them, and I encountered Jesus, but in the first one, the most, oh, the most awesome experience and in, in my life or in any life, if you ask me, if, if, if anyone was able to experience what I experienced, I don't think you would have a problem at all with going, oh, I get it. I get it. It's this union. What we have here on earth is we have this understanding or what we think, we think of a union of a husband and a wife as to being the most blessed, intimate, uh, exciting, expressive, loving type of relationship, or we hope that that's in fact the case, right? But that is a shadow, okay? What I'm saying is the very best most loving, most awesome, most intimate, deeply connected union that a man and a woman could have in this life on earth is like the shadow of the real thing. Think about it like this. Okay, we've got a house and that house is in the sunlight and that sunlight is casting a shadow this little 2D shadow on the ground of this wonderful, glorious, 
3D awesome in color, beautiful thing that you see there. Let's say that you look at the shadow on the ground and you say like, well, this looks like it's something grand. It looks like something that should be beautiful, right? And large, but if we don't have what this is in the next life, I don't want it because this shadow here looks really good to me. And you see what I'm saying? It's the shadow. But if you understood the reality that the shadow being cast from really points to, you would be going like, you can have your shadow. I'm going to take the real thing, right? That's what we have here. So when we talk about marriage, it's we understand marriage from the standpoint of our life as humans here, okay? And so we can see it within this life. We can understand it within this life. But that is so infinitesimally small in comparison to the reality that is waiting for us. What does that shadow point to? It points to what casts the shadow. And then that, the reality, is beyond what is possible for our human minds to comprehend without Holy Spirit uh, revelation. It's just not going to happen. But we can draw similarities between it, and that's the point. So as far as marriage goes and, and our earthly marriage, that's what we understand. We understand then what the role of the man in the union is or what role that God has given, hopefully a godly man in a godly marriage to be, to play that part that they have. And then the godly woman, the role that she plays as the helpmeet, as, as they are joined and they become, oh, what? One flesh. Amen? All right. They become one in that joyous union. And we see so much of that joyous union as symbolized through the Song of Songs, right? Do you see that? That gives us so much of this, so much of this. But let's go beyond that now. Because when I, when I experienced that union with God, I experienced the procession being just that marriage union. And to be able to use that term, there is nothing like it. I'm going to tell you, that's what I want. That's definitely what I, I'm not giving up on that. No, sir. I'm not doing that. This is exactly what I want. And I want it for all of eternity. You, Jesus, I want you. I want to be united with you. I want that love. I want to share it with you. I want to be with you for all of eternity. No separation. Joined at the hip, as it were, for all of eternity. And I'm asking if, if you, I, I ask, Jesus, help our brothers and sisters. Help your brothers and sisters know what that is like. Help them if they don't have an understanding of what that is, help them to understand. Open up their eyes so that they might see this because I know that they are going to reach out to you. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. So the marriage is the shadow. So if you are, from a flesh standpoint, are saying, oh, no, you know, Jesus, as a flesh man, is going to come and marry one flesh woman. And that's what he died on a cross to save everybody. I'm saying like, oh, are you missing it? You are seriously missing it. And, and, and how can we look at this in other ways in which 
we know that this is in fact the case. Why? Because we also know that there's one body of Christ, right? What, so how can we know that the body of Christ is made up of millions and millions of individual people and they all play a part in the body, right? So why would then you then take that idea and then say that if there's one bride, yeah, there's one bride, there's only one bride, but how are you going to then take that and discount the way that there's one body and say that there's only one physical single unit female that is the bride of Christ. Do you understand that in the body of Christ, there is no male, there is no female, right? We are all one in Christ. What we see in the human approach to this is just what the roles mean. Jesus as our head, he is the male figure, right? And his bride would follow him. And that's what we would say, right? We, his bride follows him. His bride loves him. His bride is like up the bride of Christ. And what's interesting about that is that bride was also a member of the body. That member, that rib that was taken out of Adam and made fashioned, formed into his bride. And outside, that bride was formed outside of where Adam was and then brought to Adam. We know that Jesus is the second Adam, amen? And his bride was created outside of where Jesus is. And this bride is going to be brought to where he is, amen? I hope that you see this. I hope that you see this. All right. So if we go along with that, and that's what I'm saying, this word, if this word is opened up to you and opened up to you individually, that word is true for you individually. I pray that it is. Amen. I receive this. I receive this word. Yes. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. All right. So we see then the pre-trib rapture of the Gentile bride. And, uh, and we also see, I find it very interesting that the bridegroom says that her, my dove, the bride, is in the clefts of the rock and in the secret place, right? That's for the bride. Come up, come away and be in the secret place. Be sheltered, right? In the sheltered and secret place of the steep pathway, right? Let me see your face because the bride is going to see the bridegroom face to face. Amen? All right. So then what do we have next? Well, after the bride is raptured or harvested up or gathered up, right? You don't gather one, you gather a, a group of things, many things, right? So he's going to gather his bride. And then what do we see? Wedding day, wedding day, I'm in. All right, so where do we, well, Wayne, where do we see wedding day? Well, follow along with me. So we had the pre-trib rapture of the Gentile bride taking place in chapter two. Well, we're going to see wedding day in chapter three. Okay. Now there's more instances, like once again, there's going to be, there's a, another sidebar that's later, but I just want to focus on this for the moment. Okay. All right. So in, I'm going to read you out of the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs chapter three, verses six through 11. All right, let's take a quick drink before we do that. All right, thank you, Abba. Okay, 
Solomon's wedding day. Once again, that's highlighted in the Amplified Bible. And then it talks about the Shulamite bride. So she is saying this. So there's the group that is saying this. What is this coming from the wilderness like stately pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, and with all the fragrant powders of the merchant? Then the chorus says, and just as a spoiler alert here, I want you to know that the chorus is the third group, the unbelieving group, the group that will be here until the very end, the post-trib group. Just keep that in mind. So right now we're going through the wedding day, okay? So the chorus says, behold, it is the couch, the palanquin of Solomon, 60 mighty men around it of the mighty men of Israel. All of them handle the sword, all expert in war. Each man has his soul at his thigh, guarding against the terrors of the night. King Solomon has made for himself a palanquin from the cedar wood of Lebanon. Now, just so you know, the palanquin, it's the what we call the litter uh, that he's lifted up. He's in the sky, right? And it's it's on the shoulders of the mighty men and they carry him. And that's exactly what happens also to the bride. So the bride is taken in the litter or this palanquin and carried with the bridegroom, okay? He made its post of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple cloth, the interior lovingly and intricately wrought by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and gaze on King Solomon wearing the crown with which his mother Bathsheba has crowned him on the day of his wedding. Oh, praise you, Jesus. On the day of his gladness of heart. Oh, amen. So that's what they're saying. So in other words, the Shulamite bride, she's going like, ah, well, here he's taking her up. And now we see the litter or the palanquin or the couch that is being lifted up. And uh, that is so amazing. You see how wonderful it is and that sort of thing. And so the chorus is saying that. And on the shoulders of the mighty men, which I think I saw that as being the angels, because when I had my afterlife experience and I went into the, the tunnel, it was lined with all these mighty angels. And they were in this beautiful blue intricate battle dress. Like they were in their their dress A's, if you understood, that was for the clothes that they wear for formal occasions. It was like that. And they were military men. And I was being welcomed through there towards Jesus at the end there. And, and I can just see that. Who is this? Who is this? Right? And we find out. So that's why I'm being carried in to the arms of Jesus. Oh, amazing, amazing, okay? So that's what the bride, that's where the wedding is now taking place. So it's not taking place here, it's taking place up there, right? Okay, and what's interesting is you see, so who is this? That is the one coming from the wilderness, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense. And what do we know about myrrh and frankincense? That is what's used to anoint uh, the bodies for burial. We know that Jesus was the one who was sacrificed for us. Amen. All right. Oh, so amazing. So amazing. So how do we see the left behind church? Anything. 
like I said, bear with me. Bear with me, please. Listen to this and don't just push back, right? Listen to this for a second and be open. Now, am I saying de facto that all of this is, is if th this is true, this is exactly how it is and anything like that? No, no, I'm not. Let God's word be true and every man a liar, okay? I am saying what I believe that I am is being revealed to me and I am showing you. And the bride, as I mentioned before, is a member of the body and it's taken out of the body, right? Okay, and it's brought to the man after it was formed into the bride just like Adam, okay? But what happens then to the majority of the body with the exception of the bride, the rib that was taken out, right? Well, let's discuss that, okay? So I'm going to read now in Song of Solomon chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, okay? And this is titled the torment of separation. And this is what the bridegroom says. I have come into my garden, my sister, my promised bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam and spice from your sweet words. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, friends. Drink and drink deeply, O oh lovers. Then they have what they say is the Shulamite bride. Well, I want you to consider because it doesn't say that. This is what they've added and what they determined that this is saying. I want you to consider it is the body, the left behind church. And once I read this, I think it will make more sense, okay? <clears throat> So starting in verse two, chapter five, I was asleep. Bing, that should be a big red flag to you folks. Wait, what? What did you say? I was asleep, but my heart was awake. I remember Jesus after he came back three times from the garden of Gethsemane. And he said, the flesh is weak, but the spirit really is willing, right? Okay. That's what we see. Yes, the spirit is in the heart of man. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice in my dream, my beloved was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with the heavy night dew. My hair is covered with the dampness of the night. She replies, I had taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I had washed my feet. How could I get them dirty again? My beloved extended his hand through the opening of the door. There's the extension of the hand reaching down. And my feelings were aroused for him. I arose to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid sweet scented myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart went out to him when he spoke. I searched for him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. <clears throat> The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took my shawl, her covering, from me. I command that you take an oath, O daughters of Jerusalem. If you find my beloved, as to what you tell him, say that I am sick from love, sick from being without him. Wow, I feel Holy Spirit so strongly on me right now. 
so strongly, brothers and sisters, don't be asleep. That's, do you understand? This is why I have said so often, and others, not just me, not just me, but many others are saying, you must be awake. You must be watching. Why is that? And, and, and what does that really mean? Does that mean physically awake, that you can't ever sleep, that you've got to put toothpicks on your eyeballs, you know, give up, uh, I can't go to sleep. No, it does not mean that. It's talking about spiritual slumber. Now let's go about, about this. The bride has been taken. The body has been left. And I want you to see what the body the church, the left behind church is saying, I had taken off my dress. Do you see? They had a dress. They had a dress. They took their dress off. Just now, and how can I put it on again? Oh my goodness. Do you understand that in that the bride was always to be ready and expectant of the bridegroom to come. And this is the way that it happened in ancient uh, marriage customs, that the bride would, she would make her dress and then she would wear it, right? Always expecting that the bridegroom would be coming. So she always had to keep it clean, be, you know, be ready and then put it on, and then wait with the candle, her light lit, and in the uh, window so that it shone. And then that way, when she heard the sound of the bridegroom, behold, the bridegroom comes. Come ye out to meet him. Well, then that way, the bridegroom can, or the bride can walk out at that moment because she's already in her dress. Do you understand what I'm saying? But here, the rest, and you can, you can look at this. We look at Matthew uh, chapter 25, where we talk about the parable of the 10 virgins. I've, I've done other messages on that. And the 10 virgins are the 10 bridesmaids. They aren't the bride. Uh, however, I think that they are representative, at least the, the wise ones are the ones that recognize that they were asleep and they were left behind, but the bride is with the bridegroom, okay? She, this, uh, the church has taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? Well, you can't put it on in time to see this occur, you can't do it. You can't do it. You've missed the opportunity, right? I had washed my feet. Now, I have talked about this so many times, and there are those, especially in the hyper grace. Look, brothers and sisters, if you are in that group, I love you. I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth, and not in a mean way. I'm asking for you to listen to this. I had washed my feet. How could I get them dirty again? Well, I'll tell you how you can get them dirty again by walking through this life and then not repenting of any sin. And you will have sin after you are saved, right? Repent, receive cleansing, uh, clean, uh, cleansing from that ask for that cleansing, be cleansed of it, and have those feet washed, okay? Have those feet washed, but here the church is going to be left behind because they've already washed their feet in court in their own estimation. So they, they go, like, okay, okay. And then we even see, even after that, they didn't answer anything until they saw my beloved extended his hand through the opening of the door. Wow. 
And what did I think about when I read that? Immediately, it came to me as Thomas. And now this is another message. This is kind of a different message. There's another three harvest groups that I can see in the resurrections or the ascensions, the three different ascensions that I see in uh, Jesus after the resurrection. And here's just a short little synopsis of that. And I want you to see that there. Three groups there. Who was met? Mary was met at the door of the tomb. She sees Jesus and she latches on to him, right? He says, no, you can't hold on to me right now. Don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. But we know that he ascends to the father. Then he comes back. And he's seen by a group of the disciples, right? Everyone except Thomas, right? Do you remember? Thomas, the disbelieving Jew, but everyone else sees him, the ones that were left behind, because what happens is she, as which I believe is representative of the bride, goes and tells the others that he has risen. They didn't know. But then after that, she tells them, then those that are there run to the tomb, right? And they go back, and I'm saying that that's representative of the left behind group. That's the second group, okay? There's lots of parallels, and we can go deeper, we can go aside. There's so many connections, so many parallels. But then what happens? Thomas, the doubting Thomas, says, I will not believe until I see with my own eyes the wounds in his hands and his and put my hand in his side. You know the whole thing, right? So then... There's a third time Jesus shows up and he sees then it, there with Thomas and he says, be believing, not unbelieving, right? All right. You now believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. And that's what the deal is here. So that that's for another message because we can go deeper into that. That's just a little tickler for you. Okay. But let's continue here where we are, the left behind church. I arose, or excuse me, back in verse four, my beloved extended his hand through the opening of the door. So then my and my feelings were aroused for him. Not aroused until she sees his hand reach through the door, right? There's something there that you can see. Just like Elisha, when he sees that Elijah was caught up, he sees that happen, and it's in that moment. It's in that moment that he tears his clothes off, and he cries out in grief, my father, my father. He knows that he was left behind. He knows that he was left behind but he gets the double portion. I encourage you to go back and read that again. That's 2 Kings chapter 2, where you can see that, okay? I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. Yep, already gone. My heart went out to him when we spoke. I searched for him, but I could not find him. That's why, because he had already taken his bride and gone. I called him, but he did not answer me. And then we find the watchmen there are going around. She's looking for him, but what's happening? She's going through tribulation here, right? She's going through some buffeting. She's going through some, uh, some difficulty. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. 
the guardsmen of the walls took my shawl from me. Okay, so there you go. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen for the left behind church. Now, let me talk about now about the third group. And that is the final group. And that is the chorus. That's the people. That's the general ones. That's the talking about the daughters of Zion and that sort of thing. That's the chorus as it's listed or the friends, depending upon which translation that you see in those types of things. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read you some verses that are just the chorus, right? And I want you to get a feeling about the third harvest group, the third rapture group, and that is the remnant Jewish believers and those. Now, see, this is kind of a little bit, this is a little bit that I have a difference uh, in as far as that, that there is going to be a harvest. There is truly going to be a rapture event that takes place uh, in, uh, in the third one. Now, I do believe that there are going to be those that are the uh, transported horizontally. You know, that, that, but I also believe that there is still going to be a vertical component to this third one as well. And while I could go into that, here's just a couple of, of reasons why I see this, okay? And that is from uh, Revelation chapter 14, right? This is the time of the great tribulation. And in Revelation chapter 14, there is uh, uh, the voice that says, blessed are those that die in the Lord from henceforth. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So let's, let's stop just a minute and think about that. In the great tribulation, so this is past the mid-tribulation, the mid-tribulation uh, harvest has taken place. But we are told that blessed are those that die in the Lord from henceforth. So what that tells me is there are more that are going to die in the Lord during that time. Now, do we know how many? No, but we anticipate it is gleanings, okay? Because there are three components to each harvest. There's the first fruits. There's the main harvest, and then there's the gleanings, okay? That's, that's another number series of different teachings that we could go into on there. But I believe that that's what we have, our gleanings in that sense that there are going to be more that are going to receive Jesus, but are going to die during that time. Now, so what happens? Don't they get raised? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I, I believe this is the case. The, the very same way that we see the pre-trib uh, uh, voice calling us up are going to be, the mid-trip voice calling them up is going to be, and I believe that that's also going to be the case for the post-trib group. And along with them, I believe that's when we get the resurrection of the old Testament saints. The last shall be first. That is us. The, the bride is first. The first shall be last. That is the Old Testament saints. They are going to be the last to be resurrected. Now, there are some that are seeing that, uh, that they, and they believe that the, uh, in, in, in Matthew uh, chapter 27, where there's a, a bunch of saints that arise out of their graves after the resurrection, that that is the main harvest of the barley. I disagree so much, so much, so much. There, there is nothing that we see, and there's others that say 
that those are all of the Old Testament saints. No, I'm sorry. I, I disagree with that. And there is nothing that you can show me because when Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you can go through verse 4, but in verse 1 and 2, it, it says that your people are going to be resurrected at the end. It's, it's at the end, uh, you know, after that tribulation, of the, the, after that day of the Lord takes place, that's when they are going to be raptured up. And that day of the Lord was not when Jesus was resurrected, okay? I believe that was a, uh, a first fruits harvest. Jesus is the first fruits, so, uh, of the barley, but I don't believe that was the main harvest at all. Uh, I believe that is just a small sampling because we have had so many. And, and, and they do that in an effort to try to put us into the wheat harvest. And the barley bride is not the wheat, okay? And there's a reason for that as well. And I, I believe that the scripture is it, it, it shows, at least from my estimation, when you include all of those, you see there are there's a barley harvest that has got to be complete. And there has got to be a wheat harvest that happens months later. That is when that happens, right? And then there is a fruit and grape harvest that happens at the end, months after that, okay? So that there's, what I'm trying to say is, yeah, if you just follow that and you look at the scripture, you can glean, if you'll pardon the pun, what the word is trying to tell you, okay? That's what's going to happen. There's going to be three groups. And so this final group, I believe out of the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, is the chorus or the friends or this other group. Now, let's let's see what they say. And I'm going to start, uh, and I'm just going to read little chorus parts here with a couple of things thrown in so that we have some context, okay? So out of Song of Solomon's chapter 2, verse 15, we've already seen that the bride of Christ, uh, uh, or at least I hope that we see that, the bride has been taken up and away. So then what does the chorus say? And if you think about that, you're just like, that's odd that they would say this. But in verse 15 of chapter 2, they say, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil and ruin the vineyards of love while our vineyards are in blossom. Hmm. Hmm. Talking about vineyards. Now, the grapes have not been there yet. They are just in blossom, right? And so catch the foxes, right? We, we, we see that. Where's another time where we uh, see foxes? We see that in the book of Judges where you've got Samson, he ties together the tails of 300 foxes and he sets their tails on fire. Well, first thing I, I was thinking, like, where do you come up with 300 foxes? That's a whole lot of foxes, right? Anyway, he did. And then you tie them together and, oh, wow, you set their tails on fire and send them through the standing grain. And it's to burn up the grain, right? That it's going to destroy that. They are going to burn up the wheat. And that's what's going to happen here. So they're saying, they're saying, catch the foxes for us. Those little foxes that spoil and ruin the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. Because why? They are there. They're still there. Okay. In Song of Solomon, chapter six verses 1 and 2 and 13. So let's see what it says. The chorus in verse uh, 1. Where has your beloved gone? 
O most beautiful among women? Where is your beloved hiding himself? That we may seek him with you. Okay? They have been left behind, and they're saying, like, wait a minute. Uh, we'll seek him with you. Where's he gone? They don't know. Now, the bride knows, and the left behind knows. So they, the chorus, has to find this information out from those left behind. Do you see what I'm saying? All right. So the left behind says in verse 2, My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of balsam, to feed his flocks in the gardens and gather lilies. In other words, he's, he's having the, the, the time of his life, if you'll pardon that pun as well. Uh, he's enjoying the wedding. That's what is happening, right? And so he's gone, and that's what he's doing. Then the chorus follows up in verse 13 with, Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return that we may gaze at you. They're asking for her to come back. And who is she going to come back with? Well, of course, with Jesus is going to be leading her coming back. And they're going to be coming back at the end, right? So that chorus, this group, then is calling for a return at that time. In Song of Solomon chapter 7, verse 1, the bridegroom says, why should you gaze at the Shulamite as the dance of the two armies? So in other words, he's asking them, why are you watching this? What does that indicate? They are not the part. So the two armies dancing, right? We've got the, the two that are mixing with each other. They're intertwining with each other. They are in union with each other right? The bridegroom and the bride. And so the bridegroom asks, why do you gaze at the Shulamite? Why do you gaze at the bride? So it's in other words, yeah, why is that important to you now, right? But it shows they are not the bride. And uh, so, and that they were left behind as well. So in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5, then here we have them coming back. And this is what the chorus says. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? Now, let's hearken back. Remember that in, let's see. Uh in the wilderness. Uh, hold on just a second. There it is. Okay. This harkens back to the wedding day, right? That was in chapter 3 and verse 6, where the bride is saying, what is this coming up? From the wilderness. Ooh, okay. So we see that, we, and we covered that in detail. But it's interesting here. But in this instance, who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? That's Jesus and his bride coming back. The chorus, the people, the friends, are still here and they are here to witness. And that's what I'm telling you, that is the third group. Well, I hope that this has been uh, in, an encouragement to each of you. I, I hope that if you haven't heard anything, uh, 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 okay, hold on, let me see. Uh, Brother Mike, Repo Man 64 says, does the word catch away mean the same thing as gathered? If not, then the bride is raptured out of danger and the saints are gathered after danger begins. 
interesting choice of words. And, and in, in, yes, I, I believe that those are symbolic, okay? Uh, when we say the catching away, the bride being harvested, gathered, uh, uh, and cat, uh, caught away, they are all from that standpoint, I, I think are synonymous. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, dear sister Sue, thank you so much for coming everyone else. Okay. This is what, what we're saying. Please go back and look at this. Be encouraged because our bridegroom is at the door. Do not be those among those that have taken off your dress because you're so busy worried about it getting dirty. You want to get back in the world and you want to be looking at the things of the world. Yeah, uh, You don't worry about getting your feet dirty. Yeah, you've already got them cleaned. You don't get to get them cleaned again. Don't do that, okay? Don't be that way. Be looking up. We're told in Luke to lift up our heads and look up as soon as we see all these things taking place on the world and to know that our redemption is drawing near, right? That means our, our gathering together to him. Now, there's two different ways that you can look at that. So, Brother Mike, when we talk about that, there's more than one gathering. So I want you to be able to look at what the context is in each of those gatherings. So gathering slash harvest slash rapture event. I believe that's where each of those happen based on the context where those are included. Okay. All right, brothers and sisters, I look so forward to seeing each of you in the clouds. I do truly love each and every one of you. If you don't know Jesus, as I just mentioned before, you need to go. Oh, my goodness. You have like no time left. And you don't want to miss this. This is not going to be a cakewalk for those of you that are left behind. And, and the, the thing about it is Jesus is trying so desperately to call you. Please come to me. He's saying, come to me, right? He's, he's reaching his hand down. And he's saying, come to me. Go to him. Go to him. As, as Brother Mike likes to say, go to that, go to that quiet place. And, and I'm encouraging you to do that. If you're in a place right now where you're by yourself, you say, that Jesus, that Jesus you're talking about, I want to know that love. I want to know that desire for me. I'm asking, I believe, Jesus, I believe right now that you died for me, for me personally. You did it because you want a relationship with me and you paid a debt I can't pay. I receive that payment now, that free gift now. And I ask you to cleanse me, cover me with your precious blood, your cleansing blood. Renew me, renew a spirit in me. Fill me with your spirit and make me a part of your bride. Luke chapter 21, verse 36 says, and this book, the book of Luke was written to the bride. So I want you to consider that that's the audience. Luke 21, 36, it says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all of these things. That's all the stuff that we're seeing in the world right now. And to stand before the Son of Man. That's marriage language, brothers and sisters. Marriage language. Because they stood at the base of the mountain in Exodus chapter 19. And they received the word. That was the word for them. Will you do all of these things that you have said we will do? That's the marriage, right? Uh, that's the same thing. We want to stand. We want to stand before him. And I'm hoping you will do that. Pray without ceasing. If he is telling that to the bride, then listen to it. He is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins or any sins that happen. Look, when you are saved, and I just want to make this last point, when you are saved, if you are saved, 
you are saved. There's no unsaving you, okay? But that does not mean that you are going in one single rapture event. There are consequences to sin. That doesn't mean that there's no forgiveness to it. Yes, there's forgiveness, but there are consequences nonetheless. What, what Jesus says is that he forgives us. Our God, our Heavenly Father, our Abba, forgives us of our sins when we ask for it. And uh, But even then, that's why you've got to renew your mind, right? Because there are still consequences to that sin. It says that when you conceive it, you start with your mind, and then ultimately, when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. There's death in many different ways in the way that can happen. But the more you renew your mind, the more that you just get in line and, and, and do this, you know, desire to be do this, to do this for his sake, for his glory, for his honor, as a praise to him, a sacrifice of praise on your part for him. Do that for him. Amen. All right. I love you, brothers and sisters. Have just you keep looking up. Watch, he said to watch. No, you do not have to watch. And there are plenty that are saying like, no, 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 you don't have to watch. No, you do not have to watch. But what would be the consequence of not watching? You're not going to go in the first harvest event. You may go in the second one instead. Okay. All right. Love you, brothers and sisters. See you in the air. God bless you all. Maranatha.